All right. Hello and welcome to the fourth lesson of this online free ichthyology class. Uh, today we're going to be talking about internal anatomy. So last time we talked about external anatomy, uh, which is just things you can see on the outside of the fish. Uh, and today we're going to talk about everything that's going on inside, as well as some of the internal features of the external things that we talked about. So we're going to talk about organs and sensory, we're going to talk about the skeletal system, uh, we're going to talk about the musculature system, and we're going to talk about the circulatory system. Uh, things like respiration, reproduction, locomotion are all going to have their own lectures in the future, so we won't go too, too into depth about, you know, the features of the caudal fin or the, the features of the gills and all that, um, but I will give you a good overview so that by the end of today, you could theoretically dissect a fish, point everything out, and understand the basic function of everything that you see. So we're going to start with the control center, which is, of course, the brain. Uh, the brain on a fish is broken into six important parts uh, that we're going to talk about today. Uh, now, the brain is obviously much more primitive than modern vertebrates. Uh, it's not going to resemble much a human brain uh, for obvious reasons, but we have similar parts, of course, because we developed from fish, as we talked about in the taxonomy and in the first lesson. There are going to be some, some analogous parts. So the first thing we talk about is the cerebrum which is primarily interpreting signals from this olfactory bulb here. Uh, so the olfactory bulb is essentially smell. Uh, we'll talk about the olfactory bulb specifically at some point, um, but the forebrain here, the cerebrum, is interpreting these senses, these signals, these chemical signals that are coming through the nostril on the front of the fish here, uh, and making them into something. And this is a common theme with sensory that you need to understand. When you talk about sensing things, uh, when you, so you talk about smell, you talk about sight, uh, taste, all of those things. There is a organ or something that is receiving the signal, and then that signal will put it into a form that the brain can understand and interpret. So the eye is just built to take in light, all right? And then the signal made from that light goes to the brain, and the brain interprets what sight is. Sight is not necessarily done in the eye, right? The signals are taken in by the eye, but the brain determines what it is seeing, okay? And in the same way, the olfactory nerves, the olfactory bulb, is taking in the chemical sense from the water, but it's not necessarily determining what the smell is or the taste of the water is. That's going to be done in the cerebrum where it's receiving that signal. Uh, next in the midbrain, you have the optic lobes, which again should be fairly self-explanatory. Uh, they can vary in size depending on how much the fish relies on sight. So in fish that are living in murky water, you would expect them to have pretty small optic lobes in their brain uh, because they're not relying much on sight and they're actually relying much on taste. So maybe like a catfish, which smells things in the water rather than seeing things in the water, you would expect to have a larger forebrain and a smaller midbrain. Uh, and then you've got in the brain the cerebellum, which is mainly in charge of swimming and balance and a bunch of other unconscious things. Next three parts of the brain are, I talked about the olfactory bulb. Uh, so it's essentially tasting chemicals in the water. Uh, thinking about it as smell is a little weird because smell is something that gets transferred through the air. Uh, we might call it smelling, but what it really is is it's tasting. It is those chemicals in the water and it is tracing those amounts. It is marking them down, sending a signal to the brain, to the, olfact the olfactory bulb is sending it to the cerebrum. The cerebrum will interpret and say, okay, there was a little bit of this and a little bit of this and stuff like that. Uh, and some fish will have really advanced olfactory bulbs to pick up very, very minute signals uh, and very large cerebrums in order to interpret those signals, like say uh, salmon, migratory salmon, which are born at some point up of a river. They'll, throughout their life, migrate down the river, go to the sea, and then they have to come back to the exact place where they were born to reproduce and spawn. Uh, in fact, if they don't make it all the way back to where they originally were born, they often won't reproduce. So they need to be able to sense these tiny, tiny part per millions of chemicals in the water in order to determine and follow upriver from the ocean. Because it's not like they're taking down things as they leave their spawning grounds being, okay, I got to remember this thing and this thing and making a map. They are remembering that exact set of chemicals and smells. Uh, and their olfactory bulbs will have to be able to interpret those things, will have to be able to take those in, and their cerebrum will have to be interpreted so that they can get back to where they were born and reproduce. The pituitary gland, which is down here below the brain, it'll produce hormones. 
Uh, they're involved in reproduction and stimulating reproduction. That's something that we'll probably talk about more when we get to the lecture on reproduction, but it's important to know that it is there and it is part of the brain. And then finally, in the back, you'll see the medulla oblongata, which is the first uh, part of the brain directly after the spinal cord. Uh, it controls some of the muscles, breathing, and osmoregulation or water regulation. So this is a lot of the unconscious things that the fish's body is doing while it is not thinking. It does not have to put in any sort of conscious effort towards. just sort of happens. Then we've got the heart, uh, another considered a center of the system uh, of an animal. So basically, when blood enters the heart, and this is true of humans as well, it is oxygen deprived. All right, so blood, one of blood's purposes is to take oxygen to the parts of the body that need oxygen to work, okay? When blood enters the heart, though, it is oxygen deprived, okay? It'll enter over on the right here through the sinus venosus, okay? It'll pass through this valve into the atrium, into the ventricle, and then you'll notice the ventricular myocardium, the walls of the ventricle, are going to be very large, and they will push it Essentially, that is the pulse of the heart will push it through the bulbous arteriosus, ar arteriosus, not the best pronunciation, uh, and they will basically pump the blood. And so that is what the heart does. It takes in this oxygen deprived blood and it pumps it. Uh, and where does it pump it? It pumps it in fish to the gills and in humans to the lungs. Uh, and that is because, like we said, one of the jobs of blood is to carry oxygen to the parts of the body that need it. So when the blood, all of the oxygen in the blood has been used up, you know, it's gone through your system and all the other organs in your body have used up this blood along the way. And now your blood doesn't have very much oxygen left in it. How's it going to get more? It goes into the heart and the heart pumps it forward to the gills in fish or to the lungs in humans, which will then re-oxygenate the blood. It'll go through the system again, and it's a continuous system. And that's what your heart pumping is, and that's what a fish's heart's pumping is. So then let's talk about the gills, where it's gonna go, all right? So the gills are responsible for oxygenating the blood. Uh, so gills and fish are sort of like lungs in that they serve the same purpose uh, as in humans, where you want to get oxygen into the bloodstream so that the body can use that oxygen. Um, but gills do it very differently, obviously, because fish are taking oxygen out of the water, whereas humans are taking oxygen out of the air. Uh, so the most important thing to notice is countercurrent exchange. All right. So this is something unique to fish that makes this diffusion of oxygen from the water to the gills very, very efficient. Um, and we'll talk about it on the next slide. I made a little diagram. So gills can appear wildly differently, uh, and the entrances to gills, gill slits versus gill pores and all that. Uh, but the general idea of what gills do is what you need to take down. <clears throat> so countercurrent exchange uh, is basically this, this physics concept um, of having two things run in opposite directions of each other. Uh, so two liquids run in opposite directions of each other. Uh, and if one comes in with all of something and one comes in with none of something, then the one that came in with none will end up with all of the thing. So it sounds crazy, but look at the diagram. Basically, if the water is coming along the gills, all right, starting here, and the water will start with 100% of the oxygen that it has in it, okay? And the gills are starting pumping this direction, so the blood pumping through the gills is going this direction, starting with 0% of the oxygen, okay? So at this first point, you'll notice the water has already gone along the gills for a while. So there's very little left, very little oxygen left in the water at this point along the gills. But that's okay because the way diffusion works is it'll go from the higher concentration to the lower concentration. So there's very little oxygen left in the water by the time it's gotten to the end of the gill. But that's okay because the gill, the blood in the gills has no oxygen at that point. So of course that amount's going to go over because it's the higher concentration. And that continues all the way along to even at the beginning where the gills are at their absolute most oxygenated. That is where the water has yet to touch the gills at all. So they are also at their most oxygenated. So at every point along the way, the water is giving oxygen to the gills because the water will always have a higher concentration of oxygen than the gills. And a good way to think about this is imagine if it didn't. Imagine if they ran in the same direction, all right? So imagine the zero was on this side, okay? Yes, for the first five or so, the water would have a higher oxygen concentration and it would be, it would be diffusing over into the bloodstream of the gills for about the first four or five. But then once you got to about here, you'd reach a balance. 
right? There would be an equal amount of oxygen in the gills and in the water at that point, and diffusion would stop or would go in equilibrium back and forth across uh, in equal amounts. And then you are not getting all of the oxygen out of the water. So this is a more efficient way to get all of the oxygen out of the water rather than somewhere along the gills reaching that balance and then losing that extra potential oxygen that you could give. When the water runs along the gills, it will start with 100% and leave with almost all of its oxygen gone. Uh, and the gills will start with basically unoxygenated blood and leave with basically fully oxygenated blood. It's a very efficient process. So next up we talk about the spleen. So the spleen is a filter for the blood. There are a lot of organs in, uh, in our bodies and fish's bodies and most vertebrate bodies that act as filters for the blood because blood being clean, not clotted and uh, not filled with harmful things is very important considering it's going all over your body to all of your important organs uh, and all of your important functions. Uh, it's also involved in immune defense to infections. Uh, so this image is from a test on the spleen uh, of fish to talk about its immune defense, uh, but it was the only good image of a spleen that I could find. I'll move myself out of the way here. Uh, this is the only good zoomed in image of a fish spleen that I could find, and I didn't want to draw my own because uh, just spare you guys from my crappy drawings. Uh, so basically, the spleen will produce organized melanomacrophages, which you don't have to know. Um, they're called MMs, and when they're grouped together, they're called MMCs, melanomacrophage centers. Uh, and they fight disease and they create what we call adaptive immunity, which is basically the ability to adapt to a disease after your body has been infected with it once and be more resistant to it or maybe completely immune to it in the future, uh, which we consider antibodies in humans. We think about antibodies and that's a lot of the time what vaccines do. Vaccines give us antibodies without us having to actually get the disease or the virus in the first place. Uh, and so the spleen will make these uh, similar function in fishes, the melanomacrophage centers, and they'll fight disease and they'll create that adaptive immunity. But most of all, I would say it's a filter for blood. The kidney, also a filter for blood. Remember I said there's a lot of things that are filters for blood, all right? They're involved in the regulation of blood though, as well as filtering. So whereas the spleen is just filtering the blood, the kidney is also sometimes adding things back in or taking things out of the blood. Uh, not just taking things out, but can also add things back in to regulate chemical levels in the blood. So the spleen is basically acting as like a scene, like a net that the blood is passing through and is stopping harmful things uh, at that point along in the blood, whereas the kidney is more detecting levels in the blood and adjusting them. Uh, and in some fishes, the kidney, uh, actually in male fishes, specifically in some fish, uh, the kidney can be involved in sperm transport. Uh, so there are modified parts of the kidney that will be evol uh, evolved to transfer sperm. Then we have the liver. You guessed it, it, it also filters and balances blood. Like I said, blood is really important. So making sure that our blood is healthy and well filtered is really important. Um, but this time, you know, the kidney is going to be adjacent to the gut. Uh, so it's going to be way up here. Oh, sorry, the liver is going to be adjacent to the gut. It's way here. Um, and it drains into the gallbladder. So after the blood is filtered uh, by the kidney, it'll go to the gallbladder. Uh, it can be very large and very noticeable, uh, especially in sharks. And we'll look at a picture on the next slide. Uh, this is the liver in this fish. You'll see it's pretty big. It's got a very distinct color. Uh, and it produces a bile, which will help digestion in the stomach because you need to break the things down that you eat. Uh, you can't just eat a fish and then it just chills in your stomach and then what, what, how do you make that into food, into nutrition, into the things that your body needs to survive? Uh, you have to break it down. Uh, and so bile, which aids in digestion, is made in the liver. Um, but you'll notice it's a very, it's a very like, trying to describe it to someone who's not seen it, it's basically like a spongy, it's a yellowish, and it's very large, and it's very recognizable. If you dissect a fish, you will always probably be able to find the liver as like one of the first things uh, that you find. And in sharks, I consider it especially noticeable. So the next picture, I mean, there's going to be a lot of pictures of, uh, of dead fish in this because we're talking about internal anatomy. So if you don't like that, you might not like this presentation. A little light to tell you. But the liver in a shark is actually huge and multi-lobed. So it'll actually wrap around on the inside body cavity. Uh, and you can see how this whole thing is the liver here. Uh, it's, it's huge. Uh, and it contains squalene, which is a compound that has low specific gravity. Uh, you don't really need to know what specific gravity is, but it's basically just the gravity of a specific compound. Um, and it makes it perfect for buoyancy, having a low specific gravity. So 
swim bladders, which are an organ that we'll talk about soon, which are in a lot of fish, which allow them to help them stay buoyant and float in the water and not sink and stay at the level they want. Sharks won't have that. So instead, their liver is going to contain squalene. All right. Uh, they're large, they're lobed, and they're wrapped in the body cavity in an interesting way. You can't just pull out a shark liver by like cutting in and then grabbing it because it's all wrapped up in there. You actually have to take other things out first. Uh, next, we'll talk about the digestive system. Uh, so the digestive system is just basically a, a set of steps of food going in the mouth and then ending up going out the anus. Uh, so I just read the thing I wrote on the side. Food enters the mouth. It'll go down the esophagus. We have that as well. It is then processed into usable parts and stored in the stomach. All right. So that means that it's not going to be, by the time it's in the stomach, it's not necessarily going to be a completely full, if you ate a fish, for example, going to be a completely full fish. It's broken down into a little bit more uh, digestible parts. Uh, then it'll be digested in the intestine. So this is where they'll get the, the useful nutrients out of it. Uh, and then the extras will make their way, you know, the things that are not digested and made into um, or can't be digested and made into useful nutrients will then make their way out the anus from the intestine. Pretty simple system. It's basically just a list of steps. Then we've got the gallbladder. Uh, so the gallbladder in fish is this thing here. It is not this whole, uh, this whole piece here. It is this little, looks like a pebble that you'd find like next to a lake. Um, it stores the bile that is used for digestion. Um, so the bile that is used to break down the enzymes that are used to break down the food um, in digestion, it stores that. Uh, so an interesting thing about that, and that is where this, this image is from, this study, uh, is that when fish are actively feeding, the gallbladder will be virtually empty. Sort of makes sense if you're using up all of that bile to digest things because you're actively feeding, your gallbladder is going to be empty of that bile. Uh, and if the fish goes a while without eating, the gallbladder will be full with bile. So you can actually tell how long it's been since a fish has eaten, if you, you know, cut it open, uh, by looking at how much bile is being stored in the gallbladder. Then we have the pancreas. Uh, so the pancreas is an organ that doesn't often fully show itself in fish. Uh, so we think of the pancreas as sort of like an organ, you know, just like a defined thing, like a liver or a kidney, that you would expect to just be able to dissect a fish and find it. Um, but that's not true for most fish. Most of the time, what is present is pancreatic tissue. So this is tissue that serves the function of a pancreas, but doesn't necessarily present itself in the full way of a, like a independently functioning organ uh, of a pancreas. Uh, so you'll find pancreatic tissue spread throughout the body cavity of a lot of fish. On this image, you'll see it's actually wrapped here, uh, pa right past the stomach around the intestine, uh, and it creates the fluids that balance the digestive system. Uh, so it'll do a lot with neutralizing um, the things that are breaking down food because you would expect when you break down food, right, in the stomach or part in the intestine, uh, that creates like a necessarily a harmful acid. It's intended to break down other fish. If you're a fish and you eat other fish, uh, you are intending to break those down into usable parts. And so you would think then that that harmful enzymes could break down you as well, and they could if you let them get into more sensitive parts of the body. Uh, so neutralizing those, I would, don't want to call them acids, but neutralizing those enzymes that'll break everything down is important, uh, and that is one of the main functions of the pancreas. Next, we're going to look at the lateral line. Uh, so we talked about this when we talked about the outside of the fish. It is essentially a line of pores uh, on the outside of the fish that will detect vibrations, uh, and sense pressure changes and be able to tell the direction of water flow. So now we're going to talk about how it works. So essentially there's these pores on the side of the fish. Uh, they look like this. This is the green and they go into this canal here. All right. So the water will enter the lateral line into this shallow canal here. And in the shallow canal sticking out of these little purple tubes here, these nerves, is this cupula, which is a sensory hair. It's holding a sensory hair connected to sensory cells, which are connected to the nerve. So as water moves through these pores, water comes in from the outside where the fish is swimming into the side here, enters through here, and will eventually come out, obviously. It moves along these sensory hairs, which will alert the sensory cells, which will you know, create those signals, which will tell the nerves to later be interpreted, presumably, by the brain. Uh, so basically through this, through having multiple pores along the side of your body, you can tell, say, if water comes in here and flows this way and then flows out here, you can tell which direction the water is flowing. 
uh, depending on how fast and you know the specific areas that it's entering, you can tell the water pressure. Uh, you can also sense vibrations in the water using these cupula. So this is basically a highly adapted internal organ uh, with a with a pore on the outside with access to it that allows you to sense all kinds of things in the water and is very helpful in stuff like schooling, predation, very helpful in times when you can't actually, uh, when you can't see necessarily what's going on or smell what's going on, you can feel what's going on as a fish. On the lateral line will generally run down the side of the fish. Uh, sometimes if this pectoral fin here is uh, very high up, so what we consider a more modern fish, remember the pectoral fins go higher up on the outside of the fish, the lateral line will actually be more like a hump here and go above it because you don't want to sense your own pectoral fin moving. Uh, and then on some fish, the lateral line makes its way, those pores makes its way down onto the, even onto the dentary, but also onto the head. <coughs> The eyes, this looks complicated, but it's actually quite simple and it's fairly similar to our eyes, all right? Uh, so the, the lens in the eye is the most important thing that you need to pay attention to because essentially light is coming in, the lens is in charge of balancing and focusing everything, and then it makes its way to the optic nerve. All of this stuff in between is a, a little bit complicated and serves purposes, but the general idea is light is coming in past the cornea, which is the protective layer on the outside, goes through the aqueous humor, okay, which is just a liquid, another protective liquid that the light will travel through. It reaches the lens, and now the lens is in charge of focusing on certain things uh, and allows the fish to basically look around and focus on a distance like humans can. Like I can look at the thing, I can look at this top of my water bottle directly in front of me and everything in the background is blurred, all right, because that is in focus to me. But if I look up and I look at my desk in the distance, I can see my desk clearly, and now the things directly in front of me, like if I hold this up out of the corner of my eye, are blurry. So that is focusing. That is the use of the lens. And so the lens is held in place by this suspensatory ligament, which basically holds it from the top of the eye, uh, and this retractor lentis muscle, which is attached to another muscle here. And through something called the falciform process, uh, this muscle will move basically contract and uncontract, uh, which will adjust the lens. So this is the muscle that is in charge of focusing and unfocusing the eye. The signals will go through this lens to the optic nerve. The optic nerve obviously creates the signal that the optic lobes in the brain that we talked about in the midbrain will then interpret as sight. And that is how you see things. These lights reach these nerves through this complex system and then are interpreted by the optic lobes in the brain. And the inner ear is a really interesting, unique thing in fish. Uh, so you'll see fish have what you could kind of consider this an ear. I mean, to me, this just looks like someone who's got like a crazy pierced ear. And you know, like one of those people gets like the lobes with the giant disc in it. Uh, it looks to me a little bit like that. And they'll have one on either side of the brain here. Um, and so the, the main function of the inner ear in fish is that fish are really similar density to water. They have to be for efficient swimming. We'll talk about that in locomotion, but if you want to swim well through the water, you don't want to be heavier, you know, denser than the water because you'll just sink all the time and you'll have to use a lot of energy to counteract that. Uh, but you don't want to be lighter than the water because then you'll float all the time and you'll float to the surface and you'll have to use a lot of energy to counteract that so that a bird doesn't grab you out of the water. So... Because fish are similar density to water, because that makes swimming more efficient, that actually means that sound kind of just passes right through them, just like they were water. Not completely, but for the most part. And so fish have this thing called an otolith, which is basically this little rock type thing that will sit inside of the inner ear down here. Um, and it's extremely dense. It's basically a rock and it lasts a long time after fish die. So oftentimes on a beach, uh, if you were living, you like at a lake or at the ocean or something like that, you can find little white rocks and in their inner ears. They're otoliths of fish. And actually, depending on like the imprint, you can even tell if you know the fish if it's from the left ear or the right ear, calling them ears uh, of the fish. So it's really interesting. Otoliths are really unique, and you can even identify the fish oftentimes by the otolith. Uh, they're very unique, and so they're extremely dense. And so the sound waves, of course, are going to bounce off of them. And they'll bend these hair cells in the inner ear, which then are interpreted as sound by the brain. So once again, when it comes to sensory, there is an organ that is in charge of trapping those signals, right? Trapping that sound, what we consider sound, those vibrations, right? Those frequencies. And that whole, this whole structure of the inner ear is just in charge of capturing those and creating a signal out of it. And then the brain, of course, will interpret that signal as sound. <clears throat> then the swim bladder. The swim bladder is not found in sharks. So remember we said how sharks stay buoyant. We talked about they have the oily liver, the squalene in their liver. 
uh, and that actually smells really bad. So if you ever dissect a shark, uh, be aware that squalene is not a pleasant smell. So the swim bladder in fish actually strongly reflects sound. Uh, and it's actually used a lot of the times in connection with the inner ear. There's some fish will, which will have a connection, and I believe we talked about it in taxonomy, have a connection between their swim bladder and their inner ear because the swim bladder also reflects sound. So that's an efficient way to take in sound. Uh, and it's usually actually what you see when you search for fish using sonar. So if you've ever seen like on a boat, uh, you'll have like a sonar thing then that'll like show little dots on the map of where fish are. And, you know, fishermen, especially commercial fishermen, will use this oftentimes. What you're actually seeing there is the sonar reflecting off of the swim bladder. If fish did not have a swim bladder, the sonar would, for the most part, pass right through. Uh, and in sharks, oftentimes it does. You have to change the frequency of the sonar to a very specific amount in order to be able to sonar sharks uh, because they don't have that swim bladder to bounce off of. And fish will use muscles to constrict and unconstrict uh, their gas bladder, their swim bladder, uh, which will change the, the internal pressure and changes their buoyancy. So that's how fish go up and down. They're basically adjusting their own density, uh, their own buoyancy, using this gas bladder so that they don't have to swim to go up and down. They can just use these contractions, these constrictor muscles here, to constrict the bladder wall and change the pressure internally. Next we have the gonads. So gonads are responsible for reproduction. Uh, gonads is basically just the general term for testes or ovaries. It is the things that create the gametes, which are the sperm and the eggs. Uh, and they're used in mating and then, you know, become baby fish. So sperm are produced in structures called sperm ampullae, uh, which are little spherical structures. And eggs are produced from the germinal epithelium, which is just a layer within the ovary. This is a comparison of throughout the life stages of the fish so these are essentially young female and male fish these are you know adolescent growing up these are sexually mature and then this would be post sexual reproduction uh, gonads so these are just an idea of what they look like you can see they're actually fairly similar uh, even internally ovaries and testes are so now that we've learned all of the organs Let's, uh, let's review where they, we would find them in the fish. So the gills make sense, finding them behind the operculum, that cover, that flap that opens up with the gills behind it. We've got the heart here. That makes sense because it would be pumping blood into the gills, remember, to become oxygenated, past the gills to become oxygenated. We've got the liver here. That's about where we saw it. The, gas, or the gallbladder and the spleen, notice both along the intestines and the stomach. Remember their functions in digestion. Um, we've got the eggs, the gonad back here, the swim bladder towards the middle of the body because and very long because it's affecting buoyancy. Uh, we've got the brain exactly where we'd expect the brain and the kidney. We didn't talk much about where we'd find it, but that's where you'd find it in this particular fish. So now you can look at the insides of this fish and identify all of the organs. Uh, but what about the skeleton? What about the bones, the things that aren't organs? Um, that's what we'll talk about next. This is a shark. Uh, just an idea of the internal organs of a shark. You should be able to look at this and identify everything. Uh, the coloration is not exactly accurate. These things are not going to be bright orange and the pancreas is not going to be bright yellow. Um, but they colored everything so that you can clearly tell the difference uh, between everything. So now onto the skeletal structure. <clears throat> now the first thing to notice is that there are bones, there are skeletal structures uh, that hold in place fins. Um, so there are fin rays here. Uh, and spines that are holding together the dorsal fin, the caudal fin, the anal fin, pectoral fin, and then you've got the pelvic fin here. And then we've got the spine all the way down the fish, and then we have the skull here, the cranium, which we'll talk about. Uh, so this is just a good layout of the bones inside of the fish. You've got the rib cage here, which is responsible for protecting the organs of the fish. Um, you've got these rays in between the fins. We talked about that when we talked about external anatomy. Um, and this is just a general overview of the bones you would find if you were to completely remove everything except bones on a, on a dissected fish. One of those things is pterygophores, which are these bones that actually hold in place the spiny fins and the ray fins. Um, so you see we have fin rays here, the segmented ones, and then fin spines here. And the bones that hold them in place are called pterygophores. And you'll notice the dorsal fin has pterygophores, You'll notice that the anal fin has pterygophores, um, but you'll notice that the caudal fin back here will not have pterygophores. They actually have a different modified structure, which we'll talk about now. So 
in the back in the caudal fin here we have a uristyle and a high pearl okay so the uristyle is these these vertebrae here that are fused uh, and it's the very base of the vertebral column and it attaches to the high pearl which is fused hymal spines that support the caudal fin so hymal spines are the spines on the bottom of the vertebra. So see all these little spines coming out the bottom? Those are hymal spines. The spines coming out the top are called neural spines. So a bunch of these hymal spines fused together at the end of this modified vertebra at the end of the tail is called a hyperl, and that is what supports the caudal fin. So the caudal fin is not supported by these pterygiophores that you'll see in a lot of the other fins. It is actually supported by that. And so just remember hymal is the bottom spine, neural is the top spine. The central is, of course, the vertebra that everything goes through. There's a bit of an arch in between, so you've got the neural arch and the hymal arch. The ribs, again, protect the internal organs, though they don't do that amazing of a job uh, if you're coming from underneath, because the ribs do not fully connect as bones around the organs. They actually stop right about here. So if you cut into the bottom of the fish, you could just go like this and get all of the organs at once. Uh, and that's why bellies are actually very exposed on a lot of animals because rib cages don't protect there. You can't, uh, you don't have blockage for your organs along your ribs. And then finally, we'll look at the cranium of the fish. Uh, so the neurocranium is this area up here that will protect the brain. Uh, and then mostly we're going to look at this, this jaw structure, all right? The thing that makes feeding possible. We've got the suspensorium, which basically suspends the jaw in place, this whole area in place, uh, and allows for it to be protrusible. Um, so the premaxilla is this front top bone that's outwardly visible, outwardly visible. So we look on the fish, we can easily see the premaxilla as this sort of top jaw. Uh, the maxilla is essentially the bone that is behind it, that is holding it in place and connecting it down here to the dentary and to the angular articular. And this is sort of like a hinge when attached to the suspensorium, uh, which allows the fish to expand its mouth outwards. And you'll see that in this picture here, uh, when we have you know the premaxilla, the maxilla, and the dentary, the mandible all in place. Here, this is normal. And then when a fish goes to feed and it tries to suction everything in, um, it will expand everything outwards because it's all suspended from this, this maxilla here. Um, so the suspensorium is holding this bottom jaw in place right here and the maxilla fully extended vertically will allow the jaw to open very wide and create that suction force where things will come into the mouth. Next we got to talk about musculature. Um, so the muscles in fish are uh, somewhat uncomplicated I would say. I mean of course everything is complicated um, but the basic idea I'd say is pretty simple. So the first term you should know is myosepta versus myomeres. Uh, so myomeres are the sections of muscle, these big, thick sections of muscle uh, within the fish. And myosepta are thin sheets of connective tissue that are in between the myomeres, so that connect all of them. So these lines here, you ever wondered why fish flesh is lined? Uh, that's these myosepta, this connective tissue in between the myomeres. So the myomeres, like I said, they're blocks of skeletal tissue, skeletal muscle tissue, and the myosepta are thin sheets of connective tissue that are in between them. That's what they look like on two different fish. So the sections of the muscle, uh, we talk about apaxial versus hypaxial muscle. Apaxial is the top section, so this is a fish basically from the back. So this is the spine coming down here, the vertebra coming down. Uh, and this is the top half of the fish, and this is the bottom half of the fish. So the muscles at the top half of the fish we call apaxial muscles. The muscles at the bottom of the fish we call hypaxial muscles. Uh, and we split the fish via what we call septums. So these red lines are a horizontal septum and a vertical septum. So if this is the horizontal septum, then you find all the apaxial muscles above it and all the hypaxial muscles below it. Right? And this basically divides the spine centrally. So on any fish, you can draw a line directly through the vertebra horizontally and vertically. And that is the vertical septum and the horizontal septum of the fish. And then you can categorize all the muscle as apaxial or hypaxial based on where it is. Uh, so then we have myotomes, which are a muscle with a distinct singular nerve, singular spinal nerve running through them. Um, so myomeres, remember, the sections of muscle. Uh, myosepta, the connective tissue in between, and myotomes, I understand these are a little bit difficult because they're all similar, are actually just muscle. Uh, so it's not necessarily a distinct term, one can be the other, uh, but they have a singular spinal nerve running through them. 
Uh, and this is a good look at some ancestral mussel versus some you know modern salmon mussel. Uh, so you'll see an ancestral fish. Uh, you'll see that the, it's actually quite uh, connected. So the hypaxial and the apaxial muscle aren't exactly separated, right? So you couldn't, I mean, you could draw a, uh, a horizontal and a vertical septum here, but it wouldn't be that good for classifying the muscle because the muscle is connected all the way down the fish here. Um, but you can notice those myotomes and those myosepta connecting them still. You can still see that musculature. And then once you get to more modern fish, you can very easily draw this vertical septum and this horizontal septum. Uh, and you can easily classify apaxial and hypaxial muscles. Down here, you'll see this body cavity. This is where all the organs lie. So if you didn't know, organs aren't just spread throughout the fish. They're in a body cavity here at the bottom. Um, and everything else in the fish is just skeleton and muscle. So if you're dissecting a fish the, and you want to look at organs, the thing you want is around the belly, the bottom with the rib cage is enclosing. Um, there's a reason that the rib cage doesn't also go upwards on the vertebra, and that is because there's nothing up there except muscle. So there are three types of muscle. I'm uh, categorizing them with color here because that's an easy way to remember them. <clears throat> so what you need to know is capillaries. This is how we classify muscle, essentially. Uh, capillaries are small blood vessels or tubes that transfer blood. Um, and depending on how many capillaries are present in a certain type of muscle, so in any given muscle, any given sheet or uh, section of muscle, depending on how many capillaries are present there, will actually determine its color and its use, uh, and then of course how we classify it. So red muscle will have a lot of capillaries, and that makes sense. If you have a lot of veins, like this on the right here, moving, you have a lot of capillaries moving through you, so you have a lot of blood moving through your muscle here, it makes sense that you're going to get a red coloration because there's just a ton of blood moving through here. Um, and then white muscle, you'll also find in fish, has almost no capillaries, so it has a completely different purpose and will be white because there's not much blood and that's the natural, that's the natural color of muscle. And then we have what's called pink muscle, which is basically just an intermediary, it's a somewhere in between. Uh, and you'll hear when people talk about eating fish, um, white muscle versus red muscle, because people prefer certain things. And some people say, I think white muscle has no taste, um, red muscle does, and so you have to season them a certain way. Uh, and that's basically just based on these capillaries within the muscle, so how many of them are running through it. So the first one is red muscle. Uh, this is a diagram here of where you would find red muscle on uh, laminid sharks. So on sharks, you'll see it's like this, tuna looks like this, and non-tuniform fish, so non-tuna formed, so non-tuna bodied fish, uh, will look like this. So you'll notice that it's not a very uh, abundant. Red muscle is definitely present, but it is not present to the degree of uh, white muscle. So it's thin, it'll run laterally, uh, so think of the lateral line, it'll basically run along that between the two distinct masses of muscle. So when we talk about hypaxial and apaxial, the things above the horizontal septum and below the horizontal septum, um, Red muscle doesn't always fit that, or doesn't usually fit that. It actually occurs usually on either side. Um, so this is kind of an outlier, and it is in between these big hypaxial and apaxial muscle sections. And because there's a lot of capillaries in it, the reason that it's red and they're carrying blood, uh, and these capillaries, of course, have oxygen in them, because blood has oxygen in it. It's one of its functions that we talked about. There is a large supply of oxygen uh, in this type of muscle. Red muscle has a lot of oxygen in it. And so it's used for continuous swimming. The muscles recover really fast because they've got a large oxygen supply. And so the fish can continually swim. Continuous swimming just means not stopping, continue going uh, at a steady pace. So because the muscles are able to re re recover fast, you can just keep swimming. Uh, and so fish which have large red muscle densities will be able to just keep on swimming and their muscles recover at about the pace that they are using and tiring their muscles. Um, so red muscle is really good for that. White muscle, on the other hand, lacks capillaries. Um, so because there's not as many capillaries, it means that there's less blood and thus less oxygen in the area. And so what it's used for is quick bursts of swimming. Uh, so essentially this muscle takes a really long time to recover because it doesn't have oxygen or large, it doesn't have large amounts of oxygen pumping to the muscle. So when you don't have large amounts of oxygen, uh, it takes you a long time to get back up to that muscle strength, to be untired, to be usable again. You'll notice white is definitely the dominant muscle in most fish. The apaxial and the hypaxial are clearly just dominated by white muscle. And this red muscle is really on the outside here. And this pink muscle is just these thin little sheets in between them. So with white muscle, because it doesn't recover as fast, white muscle is more of like a, 
not a one-time use, but a one-time use per time period. So white muscle would be something that you would use if you were needed to quickly chase down a prey or if you needed to quickly swim and, and escape a predator. You don't want to do continuous, you know, same speed movement away from a predator or to catch a prey. You need a quick burst, uh, and that's what white muscle is useful for. Um, but it is it takes a really long time to recover uh, comparatively to red muscle because it's not getting as much oxygen from the capillaries. And so for that reason, it is not used as often. Um, and that's why there's a lot more of it because you need a lot more of it to be able to do those things. So just a quick table look, red muscle versus white muscle. Uh, so the rate of fatigue, of course, remember, it's going to take a long time for red muscles to get fatigued because they're getting good oxygen, whereas white muscles are going to take a while. The performance, the reason that they exist, what they do, red muscle is about efficiency, it's about continuous movement without losing too much energy. White muscle is just about power, just about burst, getting about where you're going. Uh, for type of swimming, when you talk about red, you're talking about slow or continuous cruising. White, you're talking about fast bursts. And red muscle, obviously, there's going to be a large, extensive network of capillaries. And white muscle capillaries are going to be fairly sparse. Um, the muscle fiber density is low in red and high in white, and the muscle mass of the fish is going to be low in red and high in white, and that makes sense when we look at, you know, this diagram here of where you're seeing all of this white muscle versus where you're seeing the red muscle. And then, of course, the least abundant of all is the pink muscle. <clears throat> So it's the true intermediary. It has somewhere in the middle number of capillaries. It doesn't have as many capillaries as red muscle, but it doesn't have as few as white. It's used for intermediate swimming speeds, so it's not quite burst swimming, but it's not quite continuous swimming. It's a little faster than continuous swimming, but it's not as fast as burst swimming, uh, and it has an intermediate recovery time. It's not going to take as long to recover as white muscle will, but it won't recover as fast as red muscle will. This is basically just an inter intermediate very intermediate connective muscle. Uh, so the last thing we have to talk about is the circulatory system. So I talked about how blood is pumped from the heart to the gills um, to be oxygenated and then it will make its way through. Well, this is what that system uh, essentially looks like. These are the veins and the arteries of a fish. Uh, so this is where all of the blood is going in the fish. All right. Just take a second look. Think about where you know all of the your organs are positioned. I mean, it, it points out some of them, the gills, the liver, and the guts and gonads. Think about where all the organs we talked about are positioned. Notice, for example, the veins and arteries going to the brain, the ones going to the muscles, liver here is surrounded by them, the guts and gonads. Um, just get a good idea of how this is getting blood to all of the important parts of the body. Uh, and then just a quick distinction, because I said there's the veins and the arteries. Uh, we have the veins in red here and the arteries in blue. Arteries deliver oxygenated blood from the gills to the rest of the body, all right? So the blue ones, the arteries, are taking oxygenated blood. It's oxygenated, think about it like that, and delivering them to all these places in the body. Um, and then once they're deoxygenated and they've been used up by these parts of the body, the veins will bring them back to the heart. Uh, and they'll be pumped into the gills to be reoxygenated. So the blue is the is the blood with the oxygen in it going to all the important places in the body that need that blood and that oxygen. Uh, and the veins are basically taking back that blood once it's been used up to bring it back to the heart so that it can be pumped into the gills to be oxygenated again. And that is all I have for today. Uh, 43 minutes is honestly not bad. I expected internal anatomy to be a little longer, but I'm going to assume this is going to be the most confusing and most question asked um, lecture that I'm going to do. So next time we talk about locomotion, as I just kind of tease that slide a little bit. <laughs> um, and basically talking about the efficiency of fish swimming, how they swim, different types of swimming, and uh, I hate to say it, but next time is going to have a little bit of math. Just a little bit, just a few equations, just a few, not very many. You don't need to know them that well. Um, but, you know, when you talk about efficiency in swimming and like hydrodynamics and viscosity, uh, math is a little bit important. Not algebra, nothing fucking, nothing complicated. Just, just, a, just, a, just a tiny bit. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoyed and I will see you next time.